Hello and welcome to today's live talk, the latest in a series of expert dialogues brought to you by Bayer. Our topic today is access to family planning. How can we ensure that, quote, healthy families are created by choice and not necessity? My name is Melinda Crane, and it is a great pleasure to accompany you today as moderator. Welcome, everyone. A little over a week ago, people around the world recognized World Contraception Day. Its motto this year was, it's your life. Why? Because unplanned pregnancy can trap girls and women in a cycle of poverty and ill health, limiting their professional and personal opportunities from the very onset of adulthood, meaning it limits their lives as women. And that harms not only these women and their families, but also their communities. In 1968, the United Nations International Conference on Human Rights declared that parents have a basic human right to, quote, determine freely and responsibly the number and the spacing of their children. Nearly 30 years later, the landmark International Conference on Population and Development, ICPD for short, recognized reproductive choice as a right that is absolutely crucial for societies to advance. Yet today, more than 200 million women in low and middle income countries are unable to exercise that right because they have little or no access to contraception, according to the United Nations. That now famous quote that I cited in the beginning on healthy families was originally spoken at the ICPD conference by the executive director of the United Nations Population Fund, which supports family planning in developing countries. And today's talk brings together two of the fund's expert leaders to exchange views with Bayer's Matthias Banninger. How can companies, governments, and international organizations join forces to make contraception available, accessible, and affordable to women and girls around the world? Here to answer that question are Gifty Adiko, a medical doctor specialized in public and reproductive health, who serves as chief of UNFPA's commodity security branch, providing technical leadership and strategic direction on family planning. She joins us from New York City. Welcome, Gifty. Thank you. Hello. And Hello, and also with us is Dr. Nagina Muntian. She's head of the Innovation Unit at UNFPA, and she's co-founder of the Equalizer, UNFPA's Accelerator Fund. Her work aims to disrupt inequality and create opportunities for women and girls. She too is a medical doctor with long experience all over the world. She joins us from New York as well. Welcome, Nagina. Thank you, pleasure to be with you. Great to have you. And finally, also with us is Matthias Banninger. He is a regular on these live talks. He's Executive Vice President for Public Affairs, Science, Sustainability, and HSE, that stands for Health, Safety, and Environment, at Bayer. And he's responsible for the group's Global Sustainability Initiative, within which family health and well-being plays a key role. He joins us from Washington, D.C. It's great to see you again, Matthias. Hello from Washington. Nice to see you as well. And dear ladies and gentlemen, just a very quick note before we start, we are eager to hear from you. Please use the comment function on this live stream to send us your questions and I'll bring them in a little bit later on. And now let's first of all talk about why it is that family planning matters. And I'll begin, if I may, with you, Gifty. The UN says that access to family planning would save the lives of 100,000 women and children every year. How so? Can you give us a sense of what lack of contraception means in practice and share some of what you've seen in your work with girls and families in developing countries? Thank you, Melinda. This is so exciting and we are so pleased that we can join this dialogue. And I bring you greetings from Dr. Natalia Kanem, the Executive Director of UNFPA. At UNFPA, we envision a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every childbirth is safe, and every young person's potential is fulfilled. And therefore, the ability to choose whether and to plan when to have a child leads to a wide range of health, social, and economic benefits for women and girls, their families and communities and countries at large. When women and girls and people, including men, 
have access to contraception, we can prevent unintended pregnancies. And as you know, many of these unintended pregnancies can lead to death and disability due to unsafe abortions or complications. Whilst also con and then we can also contribute to expanded access to education because when girls can plan, they can stay in school and then also women empowerment increases because women can stay in the labor force and participate in economic development. And there's reduction in poverty. Indeed, family planning transforms lives. And we know that as we invest in family planning, these benefits accrue for generations. Family planning is indeed the best buy and investing in family planning ensures that we achieve the sustainable development goals because we empower women and girls in societies. Thank you. Thank you so much. So clearly both direct and indirect benefits that in addition last for a long time. Nagina, if I may go to you, for all the reasons we just heard, every dollar spent on family planning delivers a return on investment of $120, according to the Copenhagen consensus. It seems like it would be a no-brainer to make that investment. So why isn't it happening? What are the main barriers to investment in family planning? Thank you, Melinda. And indeed, the return of investment is huge, and it's both social return of investment and the monetized return of investment. And even social eventually translates into economic benefit for, for any country, any society. And yet our latest state of the world population report of this year reveals that nearly half of all global pregnancies are unintended. A total of 121 million each year. This is a huge number, but it's also an indicator of how many barriers still exist for both users and those who are investing and financing this area. From the user perspective, we know that the contraceptives shall be available, accessible, affordable. We also know there are many social and structural barriers, and that's why addressing all of those barriers does require a holistic approach and also adequate investment. Without adequate investment and financing, that problem cannot be resolved. And family planning is unfortunately is still perceived as a women issue or just a health issue. And that's why instead of putting it as a human rights at the center of everything, we still see there is a huge underinvestment going into that area. So basically, from our perspective, we feel that we need to continue to build understanding of the criticality of the family planning for the economic development of society, but also to ensure that access to the rights based family planning can stay at the center of all the planning and budgeting. And I also would like to invite your gift to it a little more because she's really working very closely with the member states uh, on that issue and with the private sector too. So Gifty, maybe you can add a little more from your perspective here too. And yes, do so please Gifty. And maybe you can also make it even more concrete for us because we've just yes. heard social barriers, structural barriers. Can you describe what some of the main ones are? Right, thank you Melinda and, and um, Nagina. And so we know that Though investments in family planning bolsters progress towards achieving development targets in multiple sectors, the burden of financing is usually confined to the health sector or to the individual. And so positioning family planning as one of the most cost-effective interventions should be borne by the entire development community and not only the health sector. And that is why we work with governments to prioritize family planning in national budgets and we are seeing increasing numbers of countries positioning family planning in their national budgets and allocating resources to this very crucial intervention. But we also see that there's a limited integration of family planning services within the, within the basic package of primary health care services as part of universal health coverage and care. And so it makes it difficult to finance these services through the public sector. And therefore you find out that women have to go to the private sector to buy products. And there's a high, about one out of three women would have to pay through their own pockets to access contraceptives. And so that, so the studies we've done show that, have shown that out of pocket payments are high 
And women, even when products are available, are having to pay from their pockets. And that is why family planning is not reaching the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, and particularly including many adolescents who too, all too often are the ones who need the services. But then because of these inequities, they are not able to access, it, access these services. And that is why it's critical to advocate for policy changes that prioritize family planning and expand the funding sources for future investment, including through yeah. the private sector. Thank you. Yeah. So you're telling us basically that women and girls are facing very hard trade-offs and that, for example, a mother with a family to support perhaps has to make a choice between new shoes for her children or contraception. Uh, to keep her family uh, a manageable size. Let's go to the private sector now. Let's ask Matthias uh, to weigh in here. Bayer, in fact, has been supporting family planning programs for over 50 years and in more than 130 countries. So can you tell us something about what that means quite concretely and what's behind that very long-standing commitment? Uh, Melina, um, I think that uh, one of the huge innovations of the last century was the innovation of, uh, of in this case, hormonal contraception. Um, it had made a huge difference uh, in many societies, um, uh, certainly in, in our lives uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Western Northern Hemisphere countries. And what we are facing is that we do not uh, uh, kind of keep that promise to the now young generation that lives uh, in Latin America and Africa and parts of Asia. Um, we know the benefits of family planning exist. We also know it's probably the number one intervention we need to all make happen in order for us to get even a chance to deliver against the global goals on sustainable development. If I had for one day uh, kind of the right to prioritize all the interventions related to the SDGs, I would prioritize family planning. Oh. Now, what does that look like uh, in more uh, concrete terms? For example, we work with the Gates Foundation um, on uh, an initiative called the Challenge Initiative, which tries to make sure that we create points of access to family planning in what's so nicely called uh, informal settlements. This could be refugee camps, that could be slums, that could be places where the public health system has huge difficulties to, to reach people, where people live who often don't have access to basic sanitary or other, um, other infrastructure. Um, and I think that's very important. So we need to make sure that the supply reaches this very vulnerable uh, group of people and of course is also accepted in the communities um, and therefore lots of different tactics are necessary. The other thing we have decided to do is we decided to crack a problem that um, was, was there for quite a while and that is that even when there was enough funding and even when it was clear there was enough pull from those communities, there wasn't enough supply. So we've decided to double down and invest in additional capacity to produce uh, modern contraceptives in order to close the access gap. Uh, and, and the good news probably is that um, not every project is on time, but this one is on time. So we are just building a pretty large factory in Costa Rica um, with the goal to really close the access gap. And then thirdly, um, we work together with our fiercest competitors. So Organon is one of the other big players in the contraception space, and they've made a similar commitment like the buyer commitment. And I find that really important. I think if, if business joins forces here, we really have a shot at delivering against this very important part of the SDGs, i.e. delivering against closing the access gap. And, and if I'm correct, uh, Matthias, please correct me if I'm wrong, Bayer's uh, commitment is actually to provide 100 million women in low and middle income countries with yeah. access to family planning by 2030. That's a short time frame, but you say you're on time. Well, and, and if you uh, add to it, Melinda, that our competitor, Organon, has made the same commitment, and you just do a back on the envelope calculation of the access gap is 200 million, um, then even if we are not fully able to deliver against that, um, we get a really important step closer to the promise that we made to 
uh, young couples uh, for a very long time. Uh, and we are not living up to that commitment. And I think the pandemic has made things worse. Um, uh, and, and that's probably why unwanted pregnancies uh, are going up again. Let me go back to Gifty, if I may. And you have significant experience working with governments and partners to strengthen national health systems overall. What, if any, role can and should business play in advancing that goal? And what are you looking for from private sector actors like Bayer, really quite concretely? Okay. Thank you so much, Melinda. So we see great opportunities for public-private partnerships across the various components of the healthcare system, human resources, capacity towards expand, expanding method choice, supply chain management, and accountability. And I'll, be, I'll give specific examples quickly. So how we organize services and bring them closer to beneficiaries is key, right? So we can work through workplaces to make sure that products are available, like vending machines in schools, and we do this through private sector partnerships, and Bayer can support this. We also know that one of the barriers to increasing access and especially introducing new products is the huge startup costs required for training healthcare workers. And so the private sector can support health human resource development by investing in enhancing the capacity of training institutions, as well as improving quality of care through in-service training particularly for the new technologies that are being introduced. We also know that manufacturers need reliable forecasts. And so private sector can support governments to strengthen logistic management information systems so that we can ensure strengthened visibility of the supply chain. And of course, as we work through innovative methods, we can build com community engagement so that we can generate demand for quality products and methods. Wow, okay, four great points. I'm gonna to try to re remember them all, but I want, before I go to Matthias uh, to get a response on those four points, I'd like to first uh, ask Nagina to give us your take. What do you think are the main prerequisites for successful corporate activities around family planning? Do you have a list of do's and don'ts? I think that the key, key one I would say is a truly holistic approach. We have to work on it from all ends and from angles. So when we talk about the demand, for example, that's working with that woman, with that young girl who is in need of family playing contraceptives. How does she know what she needs? How does she know what she wants even based on the available information? How does she know what is she, what is her right? and where she gets it, what is she entitled to get? How does she make this decision, not someone for her, but her herself making this decision? How does she have access to this accurate information, which is reliable, which is in delivered in a dignified way? Nobody judges you, nobody says, oh, why are you asking? You trust that information, you, tr you trust the source and the health provider who is sharing it with you. And the services as well, how does she, accept the services, maybe in a cultural way, which is specifically tailored for her. And how do we also remove the myths around it and the norms around it in the society which surrounds? Because that woman, that girl, she doesn't live in the bubble. She lives as a part of society. So it should be that enabling environment around her. And that's why we're saying we have to work with the whole actors, a whole range of actors here. It cannot be done by just one, by UN or by government or by community or by CSO or by private sector. Everybody should like really join their hands in that. And that provider, the health provider, that provider needs also training because that provider maybe was trained, I don't know, well a long time ago. How do we make sure that provider is trained well enough? And health supplies, how do we make sure each health center has enough supplies of contraceptives, but also enough choices? Because maybe I don't want that one. Maybe I want another one. How do I have a choice to make? The choice is very important here. And also to mention here, from my point of view, the technology and innovation, of course, plays really big role here. What we see and what we witness as an example. Yes. I'm, I'm going to stop you there because I want to come back to innovation uh, in a moment, but okay. I'm still trying to remember those four points uh, to which you essentially just added as well. So let me try to unpack them a little bit with Matthias. Matthias, um, let's start with 
the logistics supply side and training issues that were mentioned here, um, the vending machines uh, in schools, that that everything from that to ensuring a reliable supply chain, and then of course training of healthcare personnel who can knowledgeably support women in making these important choices. Can you talk a little bit about whether that resonates with you? And then in a moment, we're gonna come to the other main point here, which is awareness. Yeah, I mean, what we what we learned in 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 like going to the places where it's really hard to establish uh, basic infrastructure that that people often underestimate the role of social innovation and uh, the role of buy in. So if you go back in history to Korea after the war, it's a country where we can learn a lot about what worked because. Korea adopted family planning really fast and laid the foundation for today's success, at least of the economy in South Korea. But they didn't go with a one size fits all. They had like lots of different, um, often targeted to village level solutions ready for people. And that's kind of what, what we need to do in many parts of the world. So that and it, it's hard on the one hand side, mm-hmm. but extremely rewarding on the other hand side. Because if you empower those social innovators on the ground in the specific conditions, you, you make a really uh, important step forward. So that's that's number one. Number two, the worst thing would be that you have everything lined up, you have trained the people, you have young women who uh, uh, come, uh, older women who come and, and, and would like to access contraception. And we are talking about people walking miles and miles and miles under sometimes dangerous conditions to these places. And then there are no contraceptives in storage. Mm-hmm. That is a reality many uh, organizations face at the moment. So to have a, real, a, rea- a reliable supply is really, really important. And of course, the private sector can help with a lot, but it requires also uh, government support. And we have seen governments committing a lot to this and then not delivering. And that's a problem. I think uh, everybody who makes promises in the space of family planning needs to keep their promises. There have been too many promises not kept down the road something we have to change. Yeah? And I don't want to name the governments because they know exactly who they are. But I feel we have to we have to get serious here um, uh, because if not, uh, this all falls apart. And nothing is worse than an unkept promise in the eyes of a 30 year old mother of three. Let me, let, before I come back to you, on the topic of awareness. Let me ask Nagina or Gifty, whoever wishes to do so, to weigh in on why those promises aren't being kept. What's the political obstacle? Maybe I turn here to Gifty, Gifty. Oh, thank you. So as we may, th- thank you, Matthias, for laying it out so clearly. As we mentioned earlier, family planning is sometimes seen as a private issue between couples and not for public discourse, right? So. We, keep, we have to keep making this case about the fact that this is, it cuts across communities, benefits accrue to communities and development as a whole. And therefore that is why it's not prioritized, especially in public sector budgets. And then also women issues in most communities are in the background. And that is why as we go on, I'm hoping that we'll have the opportunity to talk about issues of bodily autonomy, where women can claim their rights because As the beneficiaries, we need to empower to claim their rights, right? And to claim these services and to hold our our, um, leaders accountable to whatever promises they make. And so, yes, it's important that we we keep putting these things on the table and reminding public, um, reminding our leaders and both politicians and community gatekeepers, and it's not just the politicians, right? So we have barriers related to religion, culture, and so many other things that have to be brought down Mm -hmm. so that women can claim their rights. 
We will come back to that a, a little bit later on, but let me now uh, ask Matthias to weigh in on the topic of awareness, which both of you mentioned as so very important. And certainly Bayer also defines awareness as critical in achieving active family planning uh, and uh, essentially creating sustained long-term change. So can you tell a little bit of what, about, about what that means in practice, Matthias? What are you doing to raise awareness? And is your audience basically just women and girls or how do you go about this? No, the audience can't be just women and girls. Um, I also wish that we make progress in the innovation space so that contraceptives are not uh, only available for, for women and girls, but also that we find ways of adding to the contraceptives that would be um, applicable for men. I think we have to add a whole suite of innovations to condoms that of course exist today, but uh, a lot more has to happen in this space. My, um, uh, I think one of the most hopeful things in the space is, uh, is the fact that the young people we talk about here in the Global South often have access to modern communication means. So smartphones are one of the one of the big beacons of hope for me. We've seen it in the um, reach of the Global uh, Contraception Day, which which uh, is now up 30 percent to last year. Uh, late in September, um, a whole coalition was able to reach more than 300 million uh, people of their target audience. That's a lot. Um, and and of course, not only the general information, but also the individual information can be delivered through digital means in ways that weren't possible 10 years ago, even five years ago in many parts of the world. So smartphones, I think, will make our solutions a lot smarter. And I just am looking at some of the comments that are coming in from our audience, which, by the way, is uh, a massive audience from uh, Cape Town, India, Mexico, Ecuador, Sudan, Iran, Guatemala, Jordan, and many, many more countries. So that is certainly very exciting. And I do have this message, uh, which says, uh, you're so right, information is key to making the right decision on my contraception. And clearly the World Contraception Day and those numbers that Matthias just mentioned are very much uh, part of that. I would like to come back to another topic uh, that was briefly mentioned and drill a little bit deeper, and that's innovations in contraception and family planning. And Nagina, as I mentioned, you are the head of the innovation unit at UNFPA. What does it mean to disrupt structural inequalities that women and girls face? How do you do that, uh, practically speaking? And what role does innovation play there? Thank you. We we really believe that that's why we called our fund Equalizer, because we think that technology and innovation can be that great equalizer that ensures rights and choices for all, for women and girls in particular. And often small improvements can make huge impact. So we are not looking always at the moonshots. We are looking at the rooftops. Sometimes the small, simple solutions work in the settings where it's most appropriate. And you're right that structural inequalities are not easy to disrupt, but it's not impossible. And we're seeing the changes there because of the innovation, because of the digital new solutions. For example, e-health platforms. We spoke about self-administration. Not every contraceptive requires visit to doctor, to health worker, and full checkup. WHO issued guidance on that, the World Health Organization, yet even in the very, very most developed countries, one has to go to health provider to get a prescription. And what to talk about like less developed countries, the emerging markets where we work, our program countries. So we need to make it more accessible. We do, We need to remove those barriers, unnecessary barriers of prescription. And this is where the digital platforms can really help. Giving the information, removing the judgment around that, but also giving access to get what you need and self-administer. And quite a lot of the contraceptives can be self-administered in a very safe and effective way. We also talk about the access to information. For example, we have a Tune Me, which works in like number of countries in Western Africa. And by now we reached uh, close to 4 million adolescents 
where they can access information on sexual reproductive health. Where do they need to go? What provider they need to reach? What contraceptive choices are available to them? Even simply what's happening with their bodies, because even that is not always available and accessible in many communities. We also spoke about the supply chains and need to know do we actually reach that last mile assurance? Do we actually, when we bring, and UNFPA is one of the largest procure and supplier of contraceptives, how do we know that it actually went to the user, to the community we want to reach? And this is where we work with the countries and this is where we partner with the governments to create such platforms like a drug dash in, in Uganda or the barcoding in Philippines, where we can really map through the simple solutions like reading the barcode on the label. And we know. Where did it go? We know which, where is overstock, understock, expiration. We can manage it. And the user then is not undersupplied or oversupplied, which is also quite a lot uh, for the communities where this is the only place as a health center where they can actually go to. We also use drones, like in Benin and Botswana. We use drones to deliver blood and commodities and supplies to the hard to reach areas where you need hours and hours to reach it by bad road. You can use drone and in 30 minutes it's there saving, literally saving lives. And another last one I want to mention among many others, of course, is that we empower women economically too. And this is a big component of empowerment. So we work and we invest in the female led enterprises who are innovating and bringing solutions to address the challenges we, we mentioned in our earlier uh, conversation today. Because with the rights, with the policies, with the choices and access and availability and accessibility, if she is not economically empowered, it's very hard for her to be that power decision maker around her body and around her, around her life. And as we know, that translates into like really huge return to economy if we do have half of the population <laughs> empowered and as an enabled workforce too. It's not a niche as, a see, as somebody see. That's the main point to probably deliver to many of the uh, of our audience. It's not a niche. It's half of the population. And in some countries, due to the life expectancy, it's even majority. So how do we see it that their rights and choices <clears throat> should be in the center of everything we do? And we actually do have an audience question that also makes that connection between financial empowerment and affordability of contraception. Caitlin Kaffin, uh, oh sorry, uh, Rajendra Sigrawat has sent us a message saying affordability is key. Working women and educated women have the ability to take this right to have kids and as newly married plan their family. Financial stability is one important factor. So let me go back to Matthias now to talk a little bit about uh, innovation, because of course it's a major driver of Bayer's work and your R&D portfolio is massive. What innovations would you say hold most promise of making contraception more accessible and more affordable? The pandemic has, has uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, you can now move into digital health solutions where you don't need to visit the doctor anymore. So at this intersection of basically being able to buy contraceptives over the counter or having to go to a doctor, there is now a huge acceptance that uh, those digital solutions uh, can get you the prescription. So it's a very simple innovation um, and we must not lose uh, the freedom uh, that that many women and girls gained uh, as a result of, uh, in this case, uh, the pandemic, forcing the, the the whole medical sector to think differently about how to interact and communicate between doctor and patient. Secondly, I think what we can see, I and mean, I'm wearing one of those uh, wearable rings here, what we can see in the whole world of wearables, that also for natural forms of contraception, we can collect more and more data, and that is something um, where we need to um, apply artificial intelligence, better understanding of body centers, uh, to come up with non-hormonal solutions uh, that might be the right choice for, for some. Thirdly, um, research and development in the area of contraceptions has, um, I think, uh, plateaued. Um, it actually went down uh, after 
uh, we had uh, uh, not that many successes to kind of further refine the sector of hormonal contraception. So we need to look into what's possible here. And, and, and I happen to believe that there must be ways to enter additional spaces, again, in the non-hormonal contraception through additional research and development. Um, and, and, and that is something we, we, we look at. And then the last innovation is, uh, and, and Gifty will be happy to hear that, is in the area of differentiating your pricing and your business models. The same is true for all access to medicine. Yeah. If you are smart on differentiating your pricing, you can provide access to contraception mm -hmm. for communities that are currently mm -hmm. left out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is something we work on uh, quite deliberately, for example, in places like India, mm -hmm. where we have completely changed the way we price contraceptives, uh, with, which led to additional opportunities for women to access them. Very interesting indeed. Thank you so much. And I have a comment that came in, which is uh, somewhat related uh, to that point and also to what we heard earlier. Amazia Odia says, in innovation, I totally agree with ensuring that options are country tailored in order to win. The role of culture and how the public sector at the primary care level works closely with community leaders needs to be taken into key consideration, especially in African communities. Supply is one thing, but implementation and use is another goal that will bring change and make a significant impact. Let us now move uh, to talk a little bit more about the nexus between family planning and sustainable development. And Gifty, if I could go to you on this, we talked earlier about the quality of life benefits that pl family planning delivers for women, including the chance to pursue meaningful work in the same way that men do. The Gates Foundation recently released a report showing that the world will not reach gender equality until at least 2108. I repeat, 21, 2108, a full three generations later than it originally been projected. So clearly family planning could accelerate progress. How can we draw attention to this contraception equality synergy and scale up efforts to reinforce it? Yes, uh, Melinda, yes. The report highlighted that more needs to be done to accelerate progress, not just in empowering women, but ensuring that women do have the economic power and decision-making power at family and community levels. And I think we've touched on some of these things in our earlier comments. Because unintended pregnancy has been an invisible crisis for far too long. And therefore we call on policymakers and community leaders to work to change society's priorities by expanding choices and resources for women and girls. There are a number of areas that need change in approaches. For instance, we need to adapt to bring services closer to workplaces so that women can achieve their career and economic aspirations. We all know that following COVID, we became more flexible with our work-life environment and we are all adapting to a new normal of doing things. And so we can make these changes if we prioritize them and ensure that we reach beneficiaries where they are so that women don't have to leave their businesses just to attend a clinic to obtain a service. For instance, there are women who would have to leave the market and queue the whole day to obtain a product of their choice. And that is a real barrier. And therefore, if we can adapt some of our methodologies, they can stay in their workplaces access these um, products, and then they can achieve their economic aspirations. And therefore, to do this, we need to listen to the voices of women when designing responses to this crisis of unintended pregnancies. And we do this in UNFPA by working with women-led organizations because they can ensure insights about their real-world needs and can inform the creation of policies. And we need to also invest in research to better understand the drivers and impacts of unintended pregnancies and ensure that both women and men have contraceptives that work for their bodies and circumstances. And so we must promote gender equality in all aspects of policy, because when we do that, we're able to break down barriers that women face whilst completing their education and entering the workplace. And then we can support innovative and social support programs so that they can exercise their rights to choose. 
Thanks. Thank you very much. And if I could go to uh, Nagina now, and we had the comment just now from Amaze Odia uh, in regard to uh, country-oriented solutions and particularly the challenges in African communities. And in fact, uh, I have a statistic here that uh, at least it came as a surprise to me. The UN projects that the world population will reach 8 billion people on November 15th of this year. So just a little bit over a month away. And that's well on the way, of course, to 10 billion by 2050. The countries of sub-Saharan Africa are expected to contribute more than half of the increase between now and 2050. That's an enormous increment that they alone will be accounting for. So if we come back to some of the barriers that both of you have been mentioning, how can we particularly ensure that access to family planning reaches women and girls in sub-Saharan Africa, where this massive population boom is, is set to occur? Thank you. And I just would like to also add that 8 billion people is an incredible milestone, but it's both cause of for celebration, but also a cause to have a call for action. Why it's cause for celebration? Because really in the last decades, we had achieved quite a lot. We reduced poverty, we achieved remarkable advancement in healthcare, we reduced maternal mortality, and access to contraceptives too, to family planning. We reduced the unmet needs, but more can be done. And what we see also that the highest shares of people are educated these days, and live healthier and longer lives uh, than any previous point in history. Why it's called for action? Because we know that 80% of this 8 billion to come live in developing countries, in emerging markets. Half of them are women. And their rights and opportunities determine our collective future. If we invest now, then this 8 billion will become infinitive opportunities. And the development for the whole uh, planet, basically. So you mentioned Sub-Saharan Africa. Indeed, the future population growth will pose challenges to expanding coverage of reproductive health care services, and not only because the population increasing. So basically, uh, from now to 2030, we know that Sub-Saharan Africa will see 60% increase in the number of users of modern contraceptive methods. Do the system, do the suppliers, do the governments up to speed to address that big and huge increase? Maybe not always. And the absolute number of women with unmet needs for family planning will increase by 20%. Adolescents are a big part of this picture. By 2030, we know that over 50% of the world young women with unmet needs for family planning will be in sub-Saharan Africa. So I will also now invite Gifty to contribute and talk a little more about how, what we do as an agency to ensure that access to family planning effectively reaches women and girls in Sub-Saharan Africa, because that also happens not just by us, by, but through this partnership with the governments, with the private sector. And Gifty, maybe you can um, outline a little more about that work. Yes, thank you. And so really, I mean, the 8 billion figures are cause for celebration because we see opportunities opportunities come when we invest in people so it's not about more or less but how we make choices and invest in people so that they can fulfill their potential and that is how unfp sees this so for instance in south sub-saharan africa we know that we continue to see high levels of adolescent fertility young kids having kids right and that has potential adverse consequences for their health and well-being as young mothers and for their children. And therefore, we need to support young people to stay in school, delay childbearing, so that the potential devastating effect on their health and well-being can be mitigated. And that is why it's crucial that we talk about options, giving young people power, giving them information, and giving them services that would enable them to make these choices in a way that keeps them in school and helps them to fulfill whatever ambitions they have. And also to delay when they decide to have sex and to provide access to contraception when they have decided that they need contraceptives to plan. And so really in Sub-Saharan Africa, the investments are limited. And that is why we are 
looking at all partners supporting sub communities in sub-Saharan Africa. And not only sub-Saharan Africa, but women in conflict zones, women living in refugee camps and other humanitarian settings are particularly at risk of unintended pregnancy. And many of these women are too often overlooked in the crisis response. And therefore we need to work together to ensure that we don't leave anyone in this response and we are able to find people where they are and make them count. Thank you very much. Let me just say to the audience, dear ladies and gentlemen, we are eager to hear more questions and comments from you. So please do send them to us via our chat function on the live stream. We do have about a quarter of an hour left on the clock, and we'd love to bring in more of your questions and comments uh, if, if you would be so kind as to send them. Let me go to Matthias now to talk about whether, you know, what we've just heard, uh, how you see it, but also, um, kind of link this back to an issue that Gifty mentioned earlier and which clearly uh, is also important in terms of policy making that recognizes the sustainable development contraception nexus, namely data. Bayer undoubtedly has access to huge troves of data given its global role and given the fact that you do have an enormous R&D uh, operation. So can you tell us a little bit about how you work to share data and you know, what kind of data you think is important? I mean, one of the, one of the things that we noticed uh, during the pandemic is that uh, one category of contraception, long lasting contraceptives that are, um, I mean, it's necessary to administer them uh, in a doctor's office. So for that, you cannot have like an over the counter solution. These are uh, polymers that are basically inserted and then sometimes uh, can uh, secure uh, 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 contraception for three to five years. So these long lasting contraceptives, I believe are really important um, for, for, for girls, for example, in schools. They are also inoculating many young women from being forced to marry early. Because of course, since they can't have children immediately, uh, sometimes people are not as uh, inclined to kind of try to marry them against their will often and most notably too early. So we see that data, so we see the data points and then of course we can communicate with the authorities, with other folks on what the challenge will be in the long run. Because if people do not have access to these kind of contraceptives, um, they will sometimes get access to others, but often will face uh, uh, unwanted uh, uh, pregnancies. The other area um, where we have data from an area that is completely disconnected, so it seems, is in the area of smallholder farmers. So if you if you meet a female smallholder farmer, and there are millions, hundreds of millions of women who are responsible for farms uh, around the world, um, their biggest risk is not climate change, even though it's a big risk. It's not shortage of water um, or crop failure as a result um, of insects or even the fact that they don't have land property rights. Their biggest risk to be successful as a farmer is unwanted pregnancy. And these are data points we need to be clear about. You asked earlier in this conversation, what is this nexus between sustainable development and uh, family planning? So food security, not only for a smaller family, because there are not that many babies in the family, not many children uh, a family need to take care of, but also food security in the sense of enabling smallholder farmers to be able to produce um, is, is an example where you see an intersection that some people don't see at first glance. And, and, and my sense is uh, one of the big challenges we have is to get these contraceptives into the rural areas. And thus, smallholders are facing a challenge that nobody who isn't in their shoes, if they at all have shoes, uh, thinks about. Very interesting. Thank you so much for that. And I have a question that has come in from Andrea Mudermann, and I think I'll, I'll pose it first to Matthias. Um, and it's this, what about adding a euro or a dollar on each contraception product that's sold in Europe 
and giving that to sub-Sahara education projects and NGOs, uh, you know, for example, to teach children very early in school about contraception. Well, you can add uh, something to the product, but of course, uh, that's always a challenge. Um, the prices for these kind of products are negotiated with healthcare providers, and it's not an easy feat, uh, to be very honest. But I think uh, what you can do is you can mobilize money from foundations. You can invest in additional uh, capacities for family planning. So uh, we at Bayer have decided not necessarily to ask the consumer to pay directly for it, but to allocate resources to increasing access to contraceptives that without this very clear goal would have gone somewhere else. That is our way to do it. Uh, and also, we try to partner with as many as possible, um, rather than just trying to do things on our own. Um, uh, when when I talk to our experts, and um, uh, there there are many of them, Frank Strelo, who probably Nigina and Gifty, you know very well, um, he he has this very interesting triangle that he often talks about. So there is demand, and we heard demand is only going up. Yeah, we speak of a 200 million access gap today, if we don't do anything, if we don't do enough now, this access gap will widen, it will not narrow. Yeah? Then there is funding. And, and that's where the setbacks of government funding need to come in. And then the main role that I see for a company like Bayer that knows how to make these very complex products is we need to ensure there is enough supply. That's why our priority decision was let's invest in broadening the supply and it's two countries, it's Finland and it's Costa Rica, who are basically the backbone of our operation. Um, one produces the hormones, the other produces the uh, additional technology needed for those long lasting contraception, all the polymers, all of those technologies that allow a slow, slow release um, uh, 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 application of hormones. That's, that's, that's really important uh, from our perspective. And we have set a quantitative target against which leadership of Bayer is rewarded. So when people talk about sustainability target, they always go to the direction of carbon. And I do believe companies need to be rewarded for reducing their carbon emissions. That needs to be a hard KPI for management teams. But we have added social dimensions to it. And in this case, one of them is that we want to reward progress against reaching 100 million women um, and improving their access to contraception. Thank you very much. And I also have a question that has come in from Steve Knopfsinger, and uh, he, he basically is saying, doesn't better family planning lead to more stable families? And that that seems like a very clear long-term investment, um, but um, perhaps not delivering short-term results. Is that one of the reasons that it's sometimes hard to convince policymakers that this is a good investment, Gifty or Nagina? Yes, and that is very much so, you know, because sometimes we see um, family planning, we don't see the long-term benefits of family planning, and it's, seen, it's very much a preventative aspect of care, right? So it's not about a disease and then immediately everybody's attention in it is on it and death, right? So this is something that benefits accrue through empowerment, through choice, and then spills over to communities over the long term. And therefore, that is that is why sometimes we don't see this as an urgent issue that demands everybody's attention. I also want to quickly touch on what Matthias said about financing and to say that um, innovative solutions to increasing resources are becoming very key and we can especially in looking at the gaps that we see in finances and we are looking at innovative solutions with regards to volume guarantees and Matthias can speak to some of these things so that prices if we are able to forecast do strategic forecasting and get the volumes then the manufacturers can plan and then they can reduce the prices right so that uh, we, we get uh, economies of scale and then also we are looking at incentives for governments to contribute to procurement. And we are working with governments to look at some of these things. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the many donors. And indeed, some individuals like 
husbands, wives, couples, individuals who have been contributing to the UNFPA thematic fund for ensuring that commodities reach the poorest people in the world. That's UNFPA supplies. And there are so many of them in the world, and I want to use this opportunity to thank them. Thank you. And maybe just to end, Melinda, one more thing Please. is to reiterate again what we've been repeating through this conversation, that family planning is not about control. And that's like very much distorted many times by some unfriendly, let's say, not friends, because family planning is about choice. It's about choice to whether to have kids, how many, when, with whom, and maybe not at all. So this is this is what we always trying to put in the center because some would use it rhetoric as as, as, a, as a mean of control. In fact, it's the very opposite of it. It's about the choice. And Nagina, that absolutely takes me back to that quote that I had at the outset that healthy families are created by choice, uh, not by necessity. And as I mentioned, that was originally spoken at the ICPD by the executive director of your organization many years ago. Let us, uh, well, I have one question that's come in from Matthias, and if you would just very briefly address this, because then I want to stay with the question of policy and come to one final, final, very important issue. So a question from Andrea Modemann. She says, I love the Bayer 100 million challenge. How do you count if you've reached 100 million women? There is a metric in the family planning world. It's called couple protection years. Uh, it took me a while to fully understand it. But basically, it allows you to standardize across the different interventions in family planning, whether you were able to uh, provide access to family planning for one couple over the period, in this case, of one year. And uh, this is the metric we use. And it's also um, uh, comparatively easy uh, for external auditors to validate that you are actually achieving your target. That's how we uh, go about this. I just want to disagree with one thing. Access to family planning is not only beneficial in the long term. Mm -hmm. I can't think of many things that are more beneficial in the short term than avoiding an unwanted pregnancy for a 13 year old girl that would like to finish her school. Yeah, that's very short term. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel that, that we forget the kind of crisis unwanted pregnancies create mm -hmm. every single day mm -hmm. for hundreds of millions of people, mm -hmm. not only for um, the immediate uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, people that, that, that are facing that, but also for their families, for their communities. And this is not a long-term thing. I think, right. I, as I said, I can't think of many interventions that have a bigger short-term return than family planning. And that brings me exactly to that final question I wanted to pose uh, to all of you. We have just very little time left on the clock, mm -hmm. but let, let me do it anyway and with the request for very short uh, comments. Mm -hmm. We did talk earlier about the lack of progress being made on gender inequality or the slow progress. And in some countries, in fact, we're seeing backsliding on sexual and reproductive rights for women, as you know. So let me ask you in closing, what for you are the top priorities going forward and what can each of us do to ensure the space for exercise of these rights, that it expands and not shrinks? Gifty? Yes, thank you. And truly, family planning has benefits immediate as well as long-term. And yes, Matthias, thank you for highlighting that. And so to ensure that we advance gender equality there is indeed a key ingredient that we can do, and that's what, that we can think of, and that's bodily autonomy. A woman's power to control her own body is linked to how much control she has in other spheres of her life, and whether she can endure, enjoy equality, which is her right. And our executive director, Natalia Kanem, has been saying that let us claim this right for each individual to make decisions about their body and enjoy the freedom of informed choices, because it, has, it is at the core of our humanity, and we should never lose sight of just how much depends on it for everyone. And therefore, governments, institutions, as duty bearers, have the obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of women and girls, and everyone to bodily autonomy. And in our own personal fears of influence, we can demand these rights for ourselves, 
and we can support girls and women in claiming it. Because without autonomy, there can be no equality. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Nikina? For me, I would say to keep the woman we serve in the center of everything we do. Uh, talk to her, hear her, uh, and, and adapt and adjust what we do for her. Keep the relevance, ownership, investment, expertise. And for us, it's ecosystem of partners. We want to aim big, but we also need to act big. And we don't want to do it as a solo act. That's for us the key. Matthias? I think we need to think about a really cool birthday gift for the baby 8, mil, 8 billion. And I think it is, apart from world peace, it is actually access to contraception. Thank you. I think that's a great note to end on. I'm very grateful to all of you for taking the time to talk about this important topic today. And thanks to everyone who dialed in from all over the world for your questions, for your comments. It's wonderful that you've been with us for this very, very important discussion. I hope that our paths cross again soon. And until then, stay healthy and stay safe. Goodbye. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. Goodbye. And thanks, Nagina and Gifty, for joining. Thank you. Both